All right, I'm pressing live now. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Here at Cabinets HR, we're doing a crowdfunding campaign on the Indiegogo platform. Please donate and share at the following link, https cabinetshr.co crowdfunding. Our guest today is Jerry Yen. Jerry, thank you for being here today. And are you ready to be great today? Thank you, Jason. And every single day I try to be great. Jerry Yen is the CEO of Advice Analytics, a cloud platform that uses 401k compliance to unlock $300 billion for $100 million every day, for 100 million active everyday American workers. He has successfully built a superstar team, launched a sales ready product, and raised $1 million all during the pandemic. Prior to founding Advice Analytics, Jerry launched digital investment advice and drove 45% revenue growth to $16 billion in assets. He successfully launched four rockets into orbit without a splash. He has held strategic, he strategic planning, sales and marketing and product management executive roles at Hewlett Packard, Gateway, and several startups. Jerry holds degrees from USCLA, Northwestern and Stanford University, and aerospace engineering and business. His latest obsessions include his wife and kids, advice analytics, and spice, spicy vegan food. Jerry, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Absolutely, Jason. Thank you. Um, and uh, looking forward to talking about all sorts of stuff. As you can tell, I, I've got a pretty diverse background. So, so Jerry, first, and tell us what Gateway is. Like, I know what Gateway is, but maybe your listeners might know what Gateway is. Uh, talking about advice analytics? No, the, the Gateway, the company Gateway you work for. Oh, yeah, yeah, Gateway? sure. Yeah, so Gateway was the computer company started by Ted Waite uh, back in the day. Uh, and they had the uh, brilliant marketing idea of putting spotted box or spots on the box. And it was basically cows from uh, Iowa and computers coming from Iowa and South Dakota. Um, and I joined that uh, company some years ago and learned, it cut my teeth a lot on uh, business development, partner market, marketing, um, and really had the chance and the rare opportunity to really speak and work and learn from Ted Waite and from a number of different really smart folks there. And, uh, and it was uh, a really fun experience for me coming out of B-School to really gain that business marketing uh, aspects to it. No, what happened to Gateway? I remember back then the Gateway was like the hot thing. It's like, it's yeah. like really up there. And then it's like, oh, no, it's like they disappeared. Like, were they acquired? They got a business? What, what actually happened to them? Yeah, they they merged uh, with e-machines. And then from there, they, um, they, you know, computers are a tough business. And they were not uh, as, as awesome as a company as it was. Um, it wasn't able to pivot for a number of different reasons. And in, in that kind of manufacturing industry, it's all about scale, it's about efficiency, um, and it's about marketing. And I think there was a great focus around marketing, um, but some areas uh, that were missing with regards to scale, scalability, uh, and process. And the wrong. funny- I could be yeah. wrong. I think back in the day, it was always people always just, it was always between gateway computers and Dell computers, right? Those like the two big competitors, I think. Yeah, I, I sure. Um, I, I'll go ahead and say it publicly. I, I had a that's where I honed my, um, uh, you know, battle that four letter word uh, as much as I can as a competitor. Um, and then later on, I joined HP and we were able to steal um, some great share. I led a team in a, a small business, targeting small businesses, where we were, we were able to steal uh, six points of share from uh, the four letter word in a fairly, <laughs> fairly short amount of time. So I got my revenge, uh, if not with Gateway, then with HP. So that was, uh, <laughs> that was always the, uh, the competitor to beat. And that's a, that's a respectful term because they, they, they really hold a, a pretty strong stance in uh, SMB in the U.S. So, Jerry, you've had success both at corporate level, corporate positions, and startups. A lot yeah. of people say, you know, you got to do things differently, the different mindsets, different methods. What's your point of view on that? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. You know, here's the thing, right? Um, you feel like a corporate startup or a corporate uh, environment is very different in the antithesis of a startup environment. So the mythology and the media will tell you that, um, and all the stories will tell you how different they are 
in terms of work environment, in terms of speed, and in terms of um, the bureaucracy. And, and I'll, I'll offer this, I'll offer two, thought, two thoughts. One, um, you'd be absolutely right about many of the differences. And then two, you'd be absolutely wrong about the two differences. And here's what I mean. I think, um, you know, I started off as very, very early on uh, as a young man going out there, I started my own business. And uh, when I was 10, actually, I started reselling these pens that you could uh, write on one side in invisible ink. And then you, on the other side, you uncap it and you color it and it becomes, uh, you can see what you wrote is a secret pen. And I was 10 years old and I found a place and I bought a whole bunch for a low price. And then um, of course, when the price went up, I went back uh, to school and then arbitraged it, right? So I basically sold it for uh, just a little bit below full price, but I was able to gain a, a hefty 30% profit. So that, that's where I started. My whole thinking, my entire life was really focused around, um, hey, go out there and let's, let's do something and, and see if we can't uh, make a few dollars off of that. And when I um, went through college and the whole thing, I, I started a couple of different side gigs, uh, which was fun. Um, but I felt like I needed at the time, and, and I don't know why, although I did have some mentors say, you, you know, Jerry, you're rough around the edges. Um, you, you need some polish. And I took my first job um, at a large aerospace company. And then my next uh, job after that was um, consumer goods. But, but basically, um, going into a large corporation, launching rockets, uh, you can't get more bureaucratic or process oriented than that. And I learned so much about the discipline of execution in that. Uh, from there, I went to Disney. Then I went to uh, um, Gateway and a few other places, right? Gateway, HP, as I mentioned, and a few startups. And what I noticed in going through the larger companies that were publicly traded, versus the smaller startups that were venture capital funded was this tremendous lack of focus or difference in focus and execution. When you're a startup and an entrepreneur, you're forced down a path, especially when you're raising money to sell the dream. You don't know how you're gonna to get to the dream uh, or you're gonna talk about a lot of ways to get to the dream, um, but that's just talk. Like everything's about the dream, the vision, the size of the market, the the type of team you have, the business model, the pricing, the growth, the, the wow value prop, the wow technology, but you haven't done any of it. And when you get to traction, like traction these days mean, uh, I, got a, I got an LOI from a large company that verbally said, yeah, it looks interesting, but the LOI is non-binding. I mean, that's traction today for early, early stage. And it's not till you get towards the million dollar ARR that private equity or larger venture capital starts really throwing series A money at you and it starts getting more interesting. What is that gap and why do so many companies fail to get to that million dollar ARR? It, it's execution, it's disciplined execution. And what you learn in corporate America is that the brilliant, brilliant execution of a mediocre idea, <laughs> is far more profitable and far bigger than a poor, a poorly executed, brilliant idea. We've heard this, I'm not the first to say that, but I can't say that enough, that execution is not, you know, the other 50%, you know, of your idea. Execution is 100% because everybody can have great ideas. But without execution, you've got nothing. You literally have nothing um, or a lot of headaches of a halfway poorly executed idea. So what I learned in corporate America was, um, and, and really you, some of the best companies, and I'll throw this out there. I thought HP was one of the best run companies I'd ever worked for, where the discipline of execution was apparent in everything we did. And sure, you're going to make mistakes. You're, you're in 168 countries with 100,000 employees. You're going to make some mistakes. 
but even the response to the mistakes had an execution discipline. And leaders there had a very high um, BS monitor, if you will, where you can't talk your way into execution. You have to be very specific. Get, and they would ask 25 whys or how, right? The, the two questions that are really the hardest to answer. Why are you doing it that way? How are you gonna get from point A, point one to A, point two? Like, don't tell me A to B or A to D. Tell me A.1 to A.2 to A.3 to, I mean, just every little detailed step. And it's not that they're micromanaging you. It's that they want to hear that you have a clear plan to get from point one to point two to point three. And they don't, they won't manage you to that. They'll just, they want you to commit, describe, commit, execute, uh, and then refine. And, and that kind of cycle uh, it doesn't have to come from corporate America, but gosh, when it comes from, you know, gold shine companies like Disney, which also is an extraordinary executor. Um, and that's, that's, I had one marketer, one finance person actually say to me when I started talking about a new idea at Disney, um, and, and I talked about the Disney magic and wonder, the finance person um, took me to task and said, you do realize that it's not just a, you know, two words. We deliver magic and wonder because of extraordinarily tight execution. We're not a marketing machine. We're an executing machine. I thought that was phenomenal to hear that internally at Disney, how very tightly they were holding everyone to execution. And that, that is extraordinary. So the challenge with, however, as an entrepreneur is that you have to balance it all, right? The idea, the visioning, the motivation, the excitement, the fundraising, the investors, the clients, and really, really tight execution. Um, all that on a nice edge between thoughtful planning and competitive hyperspeed. And, and that's all this with your own personal runway and personal risk all part of that whole equation that that's the huge chasm between corporate and startup but if you've got a vision uh, and a decent discipline of execution then it's simply about executing an even more complex scenario like uh, of founding a company um, it, it really does lend itself well to that um, training and that success in, in my opinion jerry so how do you deal with this? How do you deal with people who've worked for you in the past who have not executed to your satisfaction? Uh, you have an honest conversation. I, I, have a, I have a couple rules when it comes to leadership and management. Number one, you never attack the person. You always attack the problem. And I found that, so that first rule I learned from a, a mentor that really helped refine how I view managing people you manage people so if the number one rule is attack the problem not the person and the number two rule is set people up for success those two rules are all about you as a leader having the ultimate accountability to putting the right person in the right place at the right time and guiding them with the right guidance that's appropriate for that person that individual that plays on their strengths to set them up for success and whether, when there is a lack of execution or a miss in execution, it really is about what is the actual problem in terms of the execution? Are we not communicating early enough? Are we not aligned at the very beginning? Do we need to spend more time aligning and planning before we actually start doing? Um, is there a lack of a follow up or a, a Q, QA, if it were, as it were? in terms of checking that work is being done the way it's being done. Do I need to be involved more in the process as a leader? Do I need to offer my feedback uh, or guidance? Um, am I perhaps providing you um, uh, incomplete or worse, um, am I not communicating or articulating the goal and the priority as well? Most leaders can articulate the goal but they don't necessarily articulate the priorities that lead to that goal. And so, um, because there's always trade-offs that are made 
in that execution process. That's the real world. No, no battle plan survives the first minutes of the battle. You go into battle and suddenly something happens you didn't anticipate and you have to change the plan. But good execution is all about understanding what the priorities are, understanding what the, uh, uh, the guide, guardrails are for executing. What do we as a company um, always strive for as the highest priority? What do we put secondary? This is where you know, the corporate exercise of brand identity and who are we, right? What is the soul of HP as it were, or Disney comes, becomes very important, even more important for a startup. We are constantly making trade-offs and constantly making decisions uh, because you just don't have the resources or the time. And, and in that context, having that honest conversation about attacking the problem, how do we partner together to solve that problem? How do I, as the leader, set you up for success um, and establish metrics that are defined as success? That's rule number three. You got to define I mean, set you up for success. What is success? You have to define what that is. Um, really, to me, those are the three things I look at. Attack the problem, not the person. Set the person up for success. Define success. And then, then of course, have ominous conversations around those three. Um, that's not to say I haven't, I, I have not been perfect in leading or managing. I have put the wrong people in the wrong places. Um, and you learn from that. And as a leader, having um, what I call, you know, there's servant leadership, there's multiple ways to describe it, but I, I call it perhaps a little bit more like egoless leadership. I, I try to get my ego out of it uh, as much as I can and really focus on, you know, did I make a mistake? And if I have, then, then that's for me to fix. And how do I fix that, right? In terms of redirecting the person or guiding the person to leverage their strengths, not their weaknesses. Um, or, and so, so for me, it's really having that honest conversation, not at, but with back and forth. Um, and I've just found, you know, I have, I've made mistakes and I have um, let folks go, um, which I've always viewed as fundamentally a mistake that rests with me, especially if I've hired them. Um, and I still stay in touch with them, right? And, and that's perhaps the um, uh, a, a compliment in the context that I've, I've actually had one individual um, thank me for providing that kind of guidance for them. And they've later on become a, a very senior executive. So it's funny that, that like I still stay in touch with them and, and, and he said that that was, uh, it was the right words, the right time in his career that really changed his trajectory. Um, and, and that's that's the honest, brutal truth. But I think you can do that, you know, compassionately and with a perspective that it is ultimately, you know, the accountability rests with the leader. Um, and, and once you re once you really embrace that, then as a leader, you're very careful to hire, and you're very careful to set your expectations and their expectations, and you're very um, cognizant of their thought process in entering into that role. And, and that kind of empathy um, and back and forth conversation, I, I just, I, I, I know the first person I ever let go, I was so nervous and I was so, I, I was so disturbed um, in many ways. And I, I should have been, I was, right? And correctly so, because I, it was really looking back at it now I was much younger um, then, but looking at back at it now, I didn't, you know, I was not in the best place to actually lead them to success. And in that context, I look, I, I look at me now and I go, oh my gosh, I, I, there's so much more I could have done to put that person in a, in a place of success for themselves or for them to leave voluntarily uh, finding a place that's perhaps more suitable for them. So today I, I, I'm no longer uncomfortable with those conversations because I've earned that right and that ability to have that honest conversation with the individual. Um, so I, I, I don't find that awkward at all. I find that very um, supportive actually for them and for the company. Um, 
and as long as it's in the best interest of the company uh, and not not me, it's, if it's about the company, then then of course it it's always well grounded and never awkward. Jerry, in your bio, you state that you're building a superstar team. Um, yeah. I want to give you an opportunity to brag on a few some of your people. Like, why why do you think your people are superstars? What are the great things they're doing for you? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They're fantastic. So, you know, step one, um, and and true or not, or good or not, or whatever you want to call it, um, I'm a firm believer in understanding my own limitations. And you know, I'm not perfect, and I don't know it all. I have a vision, and I have clarity, and I have. Um, I think those two are important for any entrepreneur. You got to have a vision of what you want and you have to have clarity, like more clarity than anyone else that you, that could possibly, um, that you know, or anyone in the history of mankind could ever have about your business. That kind of clarity, not necessarily the details of how it works or your product, but the clarity of the aspect you love about your company. When you have that kind of clarity, um, man, you know who can fit and who doesn't in terms of the gaps. Because when you have honest transparency, honest clarity, like I know where I, what I'm good at. I, I've written military grade launch code. I've launched four rockets successfully. I, can, I know I'm technically um, sharp. I know that. Um, I've sold uh, and made deals with the entire state of Florida, literally the government um, over in Florida, we closed a deal uh, affecting 600,000 lives um, and $110 billion in assets in our management. So I know I can sell. I know I can close a deal. But there's a couple things I know I'm terrible at. I couldn't, I, first of all, I, I can't even whistle a tune. So I've got no musical talent whatsoever. Um, I've, uh, I've got apps and attached to that, I have like no creative talent. So I, you know, for me, drawing a stick figure, I'd probably fail at that too. So I, to me, I can't draw worth a darn. Um, I've, got to, I've got creative solutions in terms of if you've got objections, I can think of different ways to overcome them in a sales pitch. But can I draw my way out of, uh, uh, you know, uh, an open door? I, just, I couldn't do that. So I know I can't draw. I know I can't I can code, I can do data, but I, I can't always present that in a way that is easily used uh, or understood by a user. And I know I'm not as detailed in terms of all the steps of operations to, for client support, clients, for a fantastic client experience. So what I miss in terms of client experience is the team. And this is who I brought on. So Yashar Amadpour is, um, uh, he's had tremendous experience in SaaS, UX. His hobby is to, you know, look at Pantone colors and draw different stuff. And holy smokes, I, I couldn't even imagine doing that. He's got dozens of tools that he uses for his own personal, you know, doodling that to create like different logos or different things. I mean, he's, that's what he does for his, for his hobby. And, and, and he's very well versed in connecting the dots between technology and the actual user experience. And, and um, that's in terms of just competency and skill set, it's fantastic. It is, and it fills a huge gap that you could drive a truck through for me because I've got none of those skills. And so, the fact that I have zero and he has like a hundred um, is fantastic. And it's the Tao symbol, if you will, that, um, you know, the, the black fish and the white fish and the, the white eye, the black eye, the whole, like it's perfect. Like, like he and I can riff off of something and I'll be saying, yeah, but that won't fit the database. And then he'll say, okay, well, what if we did this, 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 this. And I'll say, ooh, I, I couldn't even imagine how you could translate what I just said in terms of the algorithm and the database into like this really cool mobile app. I mean, <laughs> how do you do it? I have no idea. So that's, that's the power of having that kind of team. And, and so Yashar is like amazing SaaS UX. On the other side of it, you know, I'm a great, I like to hunt. I don't say, I don't, I don't know if I'm a, well, yeah, sure. Sure, I'm a pretty darn good hunter. 
um, in terms of finding prospects, hunting them down, um, and lassoing them in, getting them to sign and, and pay us. After that, I, I'd like to move on to the next hunt. Um, so I brought on Alicia Morales, who is uh, a person I've worked with in the past. By the way, both of these folks, Yashar and, and Alicia, I've worked with in the past. I've known very well. Um, and so Alicia is phenomenal, phenomenal at all the details of client care. She came in and she immediately started mapping out the client journey from, of course, prospect, but all the way through to onboarding, to um, the, the first call, the first experience. And she was able to really drive details of our product. Because from my perspective, we created a product that's beautiful, it's highly intuitive. But, but like in any product, you want to know where to start. And, and that was the first question. She, where do we want our clients to start? That is a really good way to learn how to use the product and enjoy the product and see the value product. Oh, neither of us had thought of asking that question. And Alicia's, Alicia dives into that right away. So, um, and her background is in uh, financial services, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo. Um, we were both at Guided Choice uh, with investment advisory for 401k. So very much oriented around a great subject matter expertise, but she's also very different from myself and from Yashar. So, that's the last point I'll make, which is I wasn't deliberate about this, but, but it was an aspect of how I think, which is I really enjoy diverse teams. I enjoy it. And I've been throughout my career, um, I've been highly successful with diverse teams. And I, I truly find having that broad mix of people with different backgrounds and different cultures and different creative aspects to it, again, fills gaps for me um, and for the business. And I think it's a, it's a critical part of business success for me. Others may feel differently, but I, I know for me, I have to have that kind of diversity uh, in gender, in culture, ethnicity, background. Um, it, it's a, it makes for rich conversations uh, and, and excellent uh, ideas and, and I think for me, even better business. Um, and, and the product we have, we have our third release coming up soon, could not have come without that kind of diversity of thought and, and gaps that they fill in for me. Um, as well as, uh, so we have uh, Jami uh, Guzman also, she's um, uh, actually a student uh, that started off as a summer intern and she was so, she is so stellar and, and excellent. And, 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 I, and I have to say, you know, for someone so young to be so disciplined and yet advanced in her thinking and thoughtful and, and yet move straight to execution. She's just one of those superstars that I'm so happy to, to bring on board. That's, um, that's, uh, uh, that started off as an intern, but she's still at school, but she's, cranking away and she does like, extraordinary superstar stuff. And for me to have the opportunity to help her and mentor her any way I can, um, it simply pay forward from all the folks who mentored me when I was a young uh, idiotic kid uh, back in the day. So, um, so I, I, it's a superstar team. I'm talking to a few others that have great background as well. Um, great fit. I think the, you know, for me, it's, it, it, there's competency, of course, but uh, this is the last point I'll make, which is um, the reason I think it's a superstar team is beyond competence. It's the um, it's the way we can all work together. It's the alignment, right? And and that's so. Here I'm talking about a team that fits very well together, yet is highly diverse in backgrounds and uh, and gender. And, and also highly diverse in terms of skill sets um, and experience. And uh, I think not only can you make it work, when it works and you, as a leader, you have to make it work, uh, but when you really enjoy making that work, it just produces 
you know, a million dollar raise amidst the pandemic, third release of our product, um, some fantastic testimonials from clients and prospects, beta testers who are jumping in and wanting to, um, you know, suggesting more for the product, uh, investors who are calling me now um, all the time now, even though I've stopped raising, uh, that can, that literally, uh, not a week goes by that I don't have some investor, additional investors asking about our company. Um, and, and of course, the recent market of 401k, uh, you know, to $10 trillion, just, just the, I'll say that again, the 401k market is $10 trillion, which is larger than all the GDP of Western Europe combined. Like, I, I, boom. Right. And we've got four folks on my team tackling uh, with this kind of excitement. And, and I think, quite honestly, it's because of the diversity in skills and backgrounds and experiences of the team. And that's why I call it a superstar team. So, Jerry, what's the name of your marketing intern again? Is Jamie? Yeah, Jami. Yes. Jami? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, me and Jerry, we were first met at the Seattle Angel, Angel Conference of maybe last year, we won. And part of it is like breakout sessions, right? I actually got to talk and meet Jami in a breakout session. Yeah. I, I'm going to be honest, after 10 minutes, minutes, I was like, how do I hire this person away from Jami? Right? Like, how <laughs> this is a, wh how, wh what I got to do to convince her to come to my team, right? And she just, yeah, like, yeah. She, I, I was really impressed with her. Yeah, she's incredible. And she's a student. She's like a, I think a junior. I think, oh my goodness. She's got a huge career ahead of her. And, you know, for me, that's just, just awesome. So, so awesome to work with her. Um, she'll constantly say how much she's learning from the rest of the team. You know, we've got, uh, as I mentioned, we have Alicia Morales. Morales um, and I wanted that kind of, uh, so if, if you look at it, we're 50-50 uh, male, female. We've got, a, we're based in San Diego. We have a, a Latinx feel to it, of course, as part of it. Um, not not necessarily deliberately, but that's, that is the uh, result of it um, in terms of, of looking for a broader set of talent. And, and you know, it, that's a great example of, no, we're, we're, not, we're not holding back. You know, we're getting the best of the best. And that's because our, our net is spread out wide. We're, we're capturing talent anywhere we can. And, uh, and that's some great, great talent, regardless of background. So to me, that's a, you know, that, that's, that to me is the ultimate promise, but the ultimate deliver, uh, promise of delivery of diversity and inclusion. It's not, yes, it's because it's, a, it's, a, it's the right thing to do, but even more importantly, it's the critically competitively um, important thing to do. It's why we're going to win. Jerry, so like I said, we met at the Seattle Angel Conference last year, which, which, which you won. And you've been, you know, I would say very successful fundraising. Can you talk about how you've been able to balance fundraising, which is like pretty much ever since the Tom Suck all in, which also recruiting people, building your company, building your product, like all these things going on and any, and give any tips for people about to start the fundraising process. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it, it's uh, first of all, I, I, you know, love meeting you there at Seattle Angel Conference. I really love the Seattle Angel Conference. So I don't, I don't mind. Uh, pitching that a bit. Um, I think they're just closing out their um, SAC 19 uh, and they'll be starting. They have two every year. So I, I encourage you to check it out. Seattle Angel Conference. Uh, it's run by John Seacrest, who has kicked me in the head a couple times to, to get myself in gear. I love that guy. Um, but he'll be, he'll be honest with you. I mean, <laughs> yeah, John, sure. he def he, John definitely tells you what you need to hear and what not oh, what you yeah. want to hear. He won't tell you what you want to hear. <laughs> He'll tell you what you need to hear and you won't like it. I you know, guarantee you won't like it. And he'll, he'll keep telling you stuff until you really don't like it. Um, so much so that you try it and you find out he was right. It works. Yeah. Probably 99.99999% um, of the time he's right. He's right. Exactly. And, and that's a lot better than most entrepreneurs are. Uh, if you look at the broader market in terms of how successful they are, right? So the, 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 this market and this industry and this, this risky endeavor that we founders are undertaking is a very high risk thing. We may not think so, right? We as founders may think this is a no-brainer product, a no-brainer market. 
I just wish everybody could just see what I see. They'd understand how huge and massive this opportunity is and how I'm going to win in it. To be honest, the, the number one thing that I'd say in terms of balancing everything is to first step back and recognize not only do you not know everything, but everything you know is probably wrong. And, and that's a, <laughs> talk about a humbling experience. I don't think I've ever had a hum, uh, an experience more humbling than being a founder. Um, I'll, I'll just be very honest about it, being a, a 40 plus founder versus a 20 plus founder. And I've been both. I was a 20 plus founder. We, I founded a company. Uh, we grew it to nearly a million dollars in revenue. And uh, because of my uh, because of my inexperience and, and how dumb I was and um, how naive I was, because of how naive I was, I grew it to almost a million dollars with almost no structure. And because of how naive I was, I lost it all. <laughs> so, and it, it just crashed, right? So what an idiot. And, and honestly, now, two decades later, I'd say, I, I'm so much happier for that, ex that failed experience, if you will, because, you know, don't call it a failure. It was a great learning opportunity. But I also learned how to learn. And learning starts off with saying, I don't know, <laughs> right? When you're learning Spanish for the first time, you start off by saying, I don't know Spanish. Because if you knew Spanish, why would you take the class? So. You got to start by saying, I don't know. And walking into an entrepreneurial position or founding your own company where you have to say to yourself, I don't know. And then telling investors, I know. <laughs> saying both is, is, man, that's schizophrenic. It is absolutely schizophrenic. And what I learned very quickly is how you have to compartmentalize yourself have, and have the discipline to plan and execute. And it really does start with a self inventory. Like you, you, gotta, you gotta get brutally honest with yourself and say, not say, I know tech. You gotta say, what tech do you know and what tech do you not? And that's hard, man, when you feel like you know tech. What leadership do you know and what leadership do you not? What aspects of finance do you know? And what finance, aspects of finance do you not? That by itself is a journey through the woods of Seattle, getting lost for a few days and then coming out you know, raggedy and, and you know, but, but with some kind of enlightenment. It does require um, some time to really think it through. When you're younger, I find, and, and by the way, that's not a discouragement for any young entrepreneurs. Go, just go. The beauty of being an entrepreneur and founding a company when you're young is that you are literally, you literally don't know. So that's the beauty of it. You know you don't know, just go. So I, I love it. And I think that's the right perspective, right? If you're really smart as a young founder, you find a few people who do know and, or, or you think they know and you put your own BS test on it and don't be shy. Don't be afraid of asking a ton of questions. And I found that for me, if I asked more questions than I gave answers, I always came out ahead, always came out ahead. So, um, and that's not what I did when I was a young, arrogant 20-something uh, that, that thought he knew everything, didn't know Jack. Um, and, and more importantly, which is still okay, but more importantly, didn't seek out others who did. So how did I do it? Listen, <laughs> founding a company while, you know, you got kids at school, you got, you know, a mortgage, you got a house, you got, you know, parents, you got siblings, you got friends, you got, and then you got a pandemic on top of all that. Um, yeah, that was a little maniacal. Um, but I would say that what was nice about the pandemic, it, 
pandemic was a horrible thing. Don't get me wrong. And as we pass our year anniversary of the pandemic, um, it, it's, you know, it's the lives it's taken. It's been horrible. The economic toll is horrible. But for me personally, it forced me to slow down and stop in many ways, sit down in my, my room, this room, and literally not move, not exit the room for a while, and really forced me to do two things that really uh, I would attribute to the successful fundraising, team building, product building, uh, market building, client building, waitlist building, the, the PR that we've gotten, the whole thing. Um, and it was really to, to sit down and just pause, take a breath, take inventory. And that I spent a good few weeks um, literally just mapping out all the things I thought I had to do um, and who I was and what parts did I, and here's the, here's the key part, what parts did I enjoy and what parts did I not? Because I knew that the parts that I enjoyed, I would dive into. AI, boom, learn Python, boom, done. I mean, love it. Parts I didn't want, you know, the finance, the, you know, managing payroll, um, you know, things like that, that others might say, no problem. Me, oh gosh, I got, I got to do what? I got to do this. I, okay. Once I inventoried the things I liked and didn't like, because I know I can learn what I need to learn. I then wrote down names of people I knew that could direct me or help guide me or tell me someone that they know that could help me in those areas I didn't like. But just as importantly, I wrote down all the names of folks that, I, that could help me with things I did like. Because as it turns out, you actually, even if you like the topic, you'll never have the years of experience that someone else might have that's, that likes it even more than you. And there's one thing we've learned about social media, no matter how intense you are about something, there's, a, there's thousands of others that are even more intense than you are. And, and that's the beauty of it, right? The more we can leverage our network to really tap into experts, into things that we both like and don't like, um, number one, they'll tell you nuances of things you like you didn't know. Number two, they'll tell you things that you, the, the parts that you didn't like, that it's a lot more stuff to it than you even realize. And just having those conversations allowed me to map out this very overwhelming world of all the stuff I had to do. And then, and then corporate experience came in. HP came in where we, you know, I would deal with $2 billion projects. And what do you do? You, however you do it, how, whatever, how do you eat an elephant? You know this, right? Uh, probably. How do you eat an elephant? How do you eat a massive, massive animal that's large and with tusks and the big old thing and you know how do you eat that big massive gray elephant like you do anything you eat it one bite at a time that's all you can do you only have one mouth and you're 30 some odd uh, set of teeth and you just got a bite chew swallow next bite so that's how i did it i sat down and then said you know map out the entire global sphere of all the things I have to get done and then methodically tackle it and have a plan and execute the plan. And, and what HP taught me was create a plan and have the discipline to follow the plan, but have the flexibility to adapt when things inevitably change the plan. Um, and that's what we did. And, and I'll tell you, for every and any solopreneur out there, it's hard, man. <laughs> you don't have a partner in it. It's hard, not impossible, right? I mean, there are businesses that have been created by one person, uh, but it is hard. And I would encourage any solopreneur out there, um, you don't have to have another founder, but you got to have another person, another human. Um, I, I, I do honestly think that's how you manage it. And, and it, the timing is up to the individual, but bringing them on as a hire, as an intern, um, as a partner, it, it's up to you how, how you want to structure it. Um, but to be honest, for a good six, seven months, I was alone there with, uh, but, but I wasn't, right? I would, I would literally take walks on the beach with my wife and I would just, and you, know, 
you got to have support, man. And, uh, and ideally, and think about it, my wife is smarter than I am. She's better looking than I am. And, uh, and she's more practical than I am. So she's the one that kept saying, you got to build your product, man. You got to build your product. And she kept kicking. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But look at the vision I have. You got to build your product. Yeah, but the vision I got, <laughs> I'm talking to 25 people about this product and they all freaking love it. Yeah, Jer, build the damn product. And so come pandemic, March last year, year ago, um, she goes, okay, you're locked up in the house now. You're at, you got locked down, no excuses, build the product. And, and that's what I did. And, and at, at that point, because that was the one part of the plan I kept delaying, it was my wife that put me back on track with the discipline of that one part of the plan um, to get back to execution. And that was the first time really that I was able to get um, all cylinders executed and, and it's all about execution, right? So that, that's how, I mean, I, I don't know how else to say it other than, you know, you got an inventory and then you got a plan, which is, those are the easy parts. Then you got to execute the plan. And if you don't have that discipline of execution, find someone who can kick you in the pants and threaten to not feed you uh, or throw you out of the house um, until you do. <laughs> And, and that's, you got to execute the plan. Jerry, can you talk about how you've had to become a quote unquote vegan? Oh yeah. <laughs> so yeah, the, uh, look, I, I have a few uh, rules in life, um, you know, discipline, execution, all that stuff. But the one area, you know, of life that makes life worth living, two areas, one is like coffee. So, you know, and you as a, you know, in Seattle, Jason, you, you got to like coffee, like that's, that's like Nirvana or Ambrosia of the gods. So coffee. Um, but the other balance to that, of course, is good food and like, oh, man, you can't keep me away from good food of any kind. And I grew up like eating all sorts of great, delicious food. Um, I, I'd eat anything, like anything. I, I, I put the omni in omnivore. I was like, yeah, you know. I, I will eat it. Um, if it's edible, I will eat it. And of course, when I was younger, if it wasn't edible, I'd still eat it. And, you know, and then of course, got some consequences from that, of course. But, you know, I, I love, I just love good food. Somewhere along the path there, um, as I got into my like late teens, um, I developed what many uh, Asians will develop, which is lactose intolerance. And so for me, um, you know, the first thing to go was ice cream and that, that hurt, that hurt. Uh, then the last thing to go, I remember this so, so distinctly, the last thing that I could have was for whatever reason was mozzarella cheese. Um, I still have pizza, uh, until I couldn't have pizza. And, and that was like, a, a that was a sad, sad time. And again, it was my, my girlfriend, at the time who of course later became my wife um, who introduced me to uh, I guess lacto lactose free milk or, or dairy free goods and that was my first step into stepping away from a food um, and finding a, a plant-based substitute and and I found that to be really a, a, a really nice ability to enjoy foods again. And as an example, like oat milk, I, I prefer the smoothness and the, you know, oat milk and coffee because it's so, it, it, it itself doesn't have much flavor, but it really enhances and smooths it out so you can taste the nuances of good coffee. So this, this is where it's like, okay, that, that was great for me, plant-based. Um, but I was, that started off with being lactose free, so or lactose intolerant, so it was more kind of pushed in that arena. At some point, my wife, who followed me in that path, went all the way to a, a plant-based diet. And for years, she would tell me about the the greatness of a plant-based diet in terms of health as well as in terms of the environment. Um, and, and she would talk about how devastating the, you know, having all those cows, methane producing cows could be the environment. But, you know, I still like my steak. I still like the good rib. Um, but 
ultimately, um, ultimately, my wife went all the way plant based, and she makes the meals in the house. I mean, that, that is that's just the reality of our of our household. Uh, I, I try, and, and I, again, I big big gap for me. I I, I can make stuff that's barely edible, but um, so she took that over and over time she introduced um different parts of the meal that were plant-based and i go back to you know what are your passions of life right what's your what do you like to do what do you not like to do well she didn't really like to cook meat um because she herself was plant-based but she really really liked creating these experiments and trying different flavors and creating these different and, and leveraging these different plant-based uh, substitutes. And, uh, and, and man, her meals are just outstanding. And again, I go back to what is the outcome? Put away your preconceptions of vegan or meat or plant-based, whatever it is, and just get back to the basics. And the basic for me is I love good food. I love good tasting food. I love the texture. I love good sauces. And 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 so um, my wife started creating these extraordinarily elaborate meals. She has a whole Instagram, by the way, of like of vegan dishes. And the presentation is is glorious. Like you sit there, you look at it, you don't want to eat it because it's so gorgeous. And then and then you go, okay, I'm hungry. So you start eating it. It's delicious. The sauces are fantastic. Um, and then she starts pouring in some sriracha or some different spiciness. And before you know it, you're a spicy vegan fanatic. And that's, that's my story. I'll stick to that. <laughs> so I don't know if I'm fully vegan, but I, I, I just freaking love like the, the really good vegan food that's out there, the really good plant-based food that's out there. And I just, I just, I'll just be very clear. I work out every day. I, you know, I still have a 32 waist. I still, you know, same as in high school. And I, and I attribute a lot of that to having a plant-based diet. So yes, health is it, is part of it. Uh, but, you know, honestly, taste is the bigger part of it. I, I'm, I eat a meal and I'm not stuffed. I'm, I'm light and in fighting weight and, and, you know, I'm agile and I, I can go run and dance if if I could ever get out of the house, um, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean that's you know as you can tell I have some energy, uh, and I attribute that to to the delicious spicy vegan food that uh, my wife makes. Yeah, in, in 2019 I actually did vegan the whole year. Like first just as a challenge, can I really do this right? You know, yeah. and the first month was like really hard, right? Because because you because you, cause you all the smells of the food, right? The ribs, the steaks, you just miss it. Oh my and, god! And then like my wife and two of my kids still live home with us. Right. And this is probably exaggeration, but it seemed like every night my wife would like cook enchiladas. My son would make steaks and ribs and my daughter would make two or three cakes. Right. And like, I don't yep. remember you making this kind of food when I was like eating meat. Right. What's going on right. here. Right. But, <laughs> but then you have to say like, I lost a good amount of weight, you know, you know, my pains went away and I'll tell people, I never felt so focused in my life. Right. I just had this clarity of focus and vision and emotional challenge. It was just, it's just enough to explain it, right? And and I keep on playing going going back on it, but then I'll put a steak on the on the on the barbecue grill, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. But there's definitely some advantages to it. I, I definitely agree with that, you know. Yeah, I look, I, I tell everyone I, it's not for me a, a lifestyle or a religion. It's you know, you be you. Everyone be everyone. They, you know, everyone do themselves. That's great. I know for me, um going down a plant-based, a predominantly plant-based meal, which, uh, or diet, which by the way, I'm not, like I said, it's, I'm not religious about it. I'll, I'll go out there and have a fish. If I, if, you know, if it's, a, if I'm in a seafood city or whatever it is. Um, but I'll tell you it's, yeah, you know, I get it. Like the, the plant-based diet is not just damn healthy, but it's, it can be done right. It, it, it can be so delicious. Like I can, I can pound down more, vegan based, uh, foods, then, you know, <laughs> cause I can stuff it all in. It's all just so tasty, um, than many other meals. So, so anyhow, that, that's my latest, uh, obsession, the, the spicy vegan food that my wife's been making. So, 
So, Jerry, the few times we've been together, interacted, yeah. you're a very positive person. I think it's coming over now. You're very positive. Is this the true, Jerry? Are you are you really positive, or is this like a so uh, your entrepreneur uh, persona you're putting on like for everyone? Yeah, yeah. Really you? And then and then uh, and then when the camera's off, I I sit there and mope and complain about the world and and uh, <laughs> throw little paper uh, spit wads into the trash can. No, I I. Uh, I Look, this is who I am. I, I'm, I think I told you I'm the worst poker player. Well, it depends, actually. Um, I am your best poker player opponent you want to have. <laughs> like, <laughs> like when we're at a table, if we're if we go to Vegas and we're playing poker, you got to say, no, no, Jerry, you sit right next to me. Because <laughs> when I go all in, I'm like, I got a full house, you know, ace over threes or whatever. I'm all in. Oh, I'm like, oh here you go. And like the grin you see, my hair's like tingling and, you know, like uh, my grin is about to bust into my, my glasses. I, I, yeah, I'm the worst. Uh, I am the absolute worst um, faker, I guess. I, I, not that I try or anything, but I'm the worst actor, I guess. Um, yeah, it, it, look, I was, I, I have to say, um, it's not that I am Pollyannish. I can be very clear about the risk or about the dangers of, of any undertaking in that context. Um, but, you know, I, I, as I tell my kids uh, and my wife, <clears throat> sometimes to their chagrin, um, you know, I'm, all, I'm the adventure guy. Let's go have an adventure. And so we used to, I used to take my kids out to, uh, to Hawaii um, during the summer. And um, I would, so there's a route in Maui. I don't know if, for anyone who's been to Maui, you'll know out of, uh, out of the airport, you have to go south on the island and go around um, the big mountain there to get to the resort area. It's kind of poly. And there is a way to do that on the northwest side where you go up that trail and there's a there's a road there. And on that road, you think on the map, it's there. So if there's a road there, why can't I just drive it? And and of course the some of the maps and everything say, you know, do not drive this road. It's you know, whatever. And then in small print it says for locals only. And I said, well, look, I you know, I'm close. Um, you know, we're in California, so that's close. So why not? And uh, so one day I, 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 one of the trips, I told the kids and, and my wife, I said, hey, let's just, let's go that road. And I'm driving, of course. I'm like, we're going to go on a little adventure. And of course, my wife goes, oh my goodness, I hope we survive the whole thing. And the kids are, yay, yay, adventure. So we go on this road and I'll, I'll tell you, it's, it ain't for the faint of heart. It, it's, uh, you literally on, are on this road that is about as wide as your car. And if you, my son did this, I, I said, hey, hey, stick your head out the window there, uh, which was on the passenger side, back seat. He rolls down his window, sticks it out. And I said, what do you see when you look straight down? He goes, nothing but ocean and big rocks. I and mean, that's how sheer that cliff was that we were driving on. And it's a one lane road. You can't fit two cars. So they have little turnabouts. So when you see a car coming down the side of the cliff, uh, going the opposite way, I, I was like, I'm, I'm speeding up so I can get to that, that wider part of the road that allows passage because I can't back up this way. Uh, I don't, I'll fall off the cliff, right? So we did that. And, and you would think, you know, it's a shorter path. That's why I took it because take the shortcut. Well, Sometimes shortcuts take a long time. It took us two and a half hours to get to our hotel in what should have been a 30 minute drive. Two and a half hours because I tried to take a shortcut and have an adventure. Um, but to this day, to this day, the kids and I laugh and talk about that moment where he looked down and my son tells me that was the first time he was actually truly scared because he could see straight down like like the rocks and the ocean, you know, 200 feet below. And uh, and to this day, my wife won't talk to me about it. <laughs> she also won't let me drive anymore <laughs> on trips. Um, 
but yeah, look, I, I have fun, man. I mean, you're, you're on this earth for who knows how long, way too short of a time. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I think by being open to learning, by being open to uh, a diverse set of opinions, um, I, think, I think humanity uh, has the huge capacity to be resourceful and to, to imagine and create and do. And in that context, I am, a, I am exactly who I am. I, I firmly believe in the ability of humans to, to have good in their hearts. Um, for me to be able to have a positive impact on the world uh, as, as much or as big or as little as I can. And while I'm here, uh, pretty much amidst everything, uh, you know, when it's a dangerous situation, um, then it's about action, uh, not about emotions for me. But when it's any other situation, uh, yeah, I'll find some kind of humor or some kind of adventure in it, then why not? Let's, you know, let's have some, let's have some fun. Again, you're only on this earth for so long. So go out there and, and do some good and, and uh, be part of the good. So, and plus for me, you know, it's a feedback loop. Every time I get a smile from anyone, right? A smile, a laugh, man, that's just, that, that just, think about every smile that, that if I can create someone, if I can create a smile on someone, whatever they're feeling, I guarantee you I'm feeling 10 times better, like 10 times more. So do I want to surround myself with a lot of folks that are, you know, upset? Do I want to create an upset environment? Because I feel that 10 times more. No, I'm going to create something that everyone's laughing and, and or, or thinking nostalgically about, uh, about a memory. Um, I want to tell stories that can provide uplift and inspiration because all that inspires and uplifts and creates joy for me. So in that context, I guess maybe I'm very selfish. Um, the more I can make others smile, uh, the better I feel. And you know what? That, that's probably a good selfishness I, I could be proud of. I agree. So Jerry, I do believe there's a lot of people out there who do put on false personas. Why would you say these people need to, you know, why is the point of someone to really show their true authentic self all the time? You know, I, I, I'm probably not the best person to answer that because I don't know. I, I've always, I am who I am and I believe in being authentic, but I, I do, I would say that the, to, the, the times, certainly when I was younger, um, when I've put on perhaps a uh, or shown not what, quite what I'm feeling. There's a couple, I think, scenarios where that happens, I think, and, and it's just my opinion. You know, one is where it may not be appropriate, right? And, and feeling joy at a funeral, you know, you can feel it, but you probably need to, um, need to hide that or, or out of respect for others, right? So I think there are situations where there could be competing um, reasons. Um, I, I, and that's a real example where I, I found out I had, I was uh, admitted into a college of my dreams um, right before uh, uh, a distant relative's funeral. And so I was overjoyed, but I, I couldn't share that. And, and so I had to be very respectful for that. And that was, um, you know, there's reason for that. And, and, you know, I think that was appropriate. But there's other aspects, I too am guilty of where, especially when I was younger, I would be somewhat more insecure about something. Um, and I would, you know, the whole mantra of fake it till you make it or wh whatever you want to call it. And it's never ended well for me. I, I just, you know, whatever you want to call it. I, maybe I got negative reinforcement early on. So that was very positive for me but if i was um if i had to fake it or or, or show a different feeling or a different sense um than i really felt uh, or just outright lied um it, it just it man i just didn't feel good 
I just did not feel good. It was not real. It's not authentic. And that feedback loop, I don't know if it's from my experience or from my background or from my DNA. I have no idea. But I, I would imagine that some people may not have that feedback loop. And I, I think it's fair for, and you got to be cautious, right? It, you know, um, but getting that feedback loop, having a mirror to yourself uh, is important. I think it's very important. And, and then the, you know, the third time, maybe the third situation is where um, you're being malicious about something. And, and I, I don't know if that's, I don't know how I would condone that or forgive that, but, you know, if it comes, I think that, so for me, that's a bell curve, right? There's times that there are specific times on one tail that you do have to perhaps hide your feelings or maintain a neutral expression. And on the other extreme, there's people who are doing it for, uh, to cheat you or to, to lie to you, whatever it may be. And, and I don't know why, other than they stand to gain something uh, and they feel like that's the only way they can gain. But I do think there's a lot in the middle that um, do so because they're insecure or unsure um, or they're embarrassed about something. Um, and, and I think it's a, it's a coping mechanism. And you know, this time, uh, this day and age of pandemic and mental health, um, there's probably a lot of that. And, 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 and maybe I look too much to the positive, but you know, my view is, you know, if, this is why when someone is vulnerable and they, they admit their mistakes or they admit their weaknesses or, or heaven forbid, they share their feelings, um, honest feelings, and they get vulnerable. This is why we um, as humans tend to get attracted to that. We attracted to that kind of thing, both from a watching a train wreck sort of thing. Oh my gosh, this is so awkward. But, but also from a, wow, that's brave. Right, it's awkward, but it's brave. It's brave because boy, they just they did something I couldn't do. And I, I see this all the time. I see people getting very vulnerable, very very open, and I tend to be a little bit more private. And and wow, that's that's a brave thing for them to do. And it's hard. I think it's hard to be your true, authentic self, oftentimes because um, it, it gives people the opportunity to judge you, and and no one likes to be judged poorly. Uh, especially when it's your real self. So, you know, but, but there's a bravery to that, right? And, and so I would say, uh, I would say really to anyone who's heads about that, you know, out there, you know, especially, you know, you, when you're a teen uh, or a young person that's so affected by social media today. I mean, it's, it's so different than when I grew up, man, it's, it's, so easy to get judged uh, on the dumbest and littlest things, which you know in your heart is dumb and little, but it hurts. And, and that's a, it's a lot to ask people to, uh, I think, be brave and be authentic, um, young or old. But I'll tell you, it is absolutely liberating to, to be that authentic self. You don't, at, at Disney, we used to say you're always on stage. And that was very important as a, as a crew member uh, or a cast member that you knew that you were always on stage with your guests. And as a leader or founder of a business, you are always on stage. And so if you can be authentic to yourself, oh, then being on stage is not as big of a deal. And I would say, you know, if people fear like public speaking or being on stage even more than death. Um, if you think about just being natural yourself, as much of yourself as you want to showcase on stage, but true to yourself, it, it makes it a lot easier. Certainly a lot easier than death. So um, <laughs> I, I, to me, you know, I, I think it's important for all those who are not, think about why 
And for those who are watching others, there might be other stories there that are causing that. And how do you encourage that authentic self? How do you dig for that authentic person um, and, and allow them to be a little bit more vulnerable? And by the way, that's a great sales technique too. So for anyone, any founder out there who wants to be a salesperson, uh, you know, be, be uh, authenticity sells. Let me tell you, it's a great, great vehicle to sell your goods. And if you're, you can't be authentic about your product, make a better product. Gary, I want to go back to the corporate versus startup thing real fast. Sure. Um, so I believe there's a lot of startup founders out there who say, who say, I would never bring on someone from corporate. I'll never recruit a corporate person, blase, blase. It's safe for me to presume that you believe this, this could potentially be a big mistake with a startup, right? I think it's a mistake for any founder to say never at all. Like, like if, if there's anything, I would say uh, as a founder, never say never. Because <laughs> you never know. <laughs> I mean, how do you know? You, you have, look, as a startup founder, you are in the most uncertain of business situations. You have no clue, really, what you'll need five years from now, two years from now, maybe two quarters from now. You have no idea. You have no idea because if your business takes off, you need professional sales who worked at a corporate environment and knows the proper sales discipline to be able to scale, maybe. Point is, you don't know. So I would say to any founder, you know, sorry to get Star Wars, but, you know, only the Sith operate in absolutes, right? So, no, you can't have absolutes. You can't, you can't say, well, I had to throw in a Star Wars reference in there, I guess. So, <laughs> so I'm a geek. But, uh, but yeah, you can't, I, I don't think, personally, I don't think a startup founder should ever say never. I would say, though, every founder should recognize what comes with corporate experience, um, both good and bad for your particular uh, startup, right? Both uh, uh, good and bad is so value-based, both appropriate and inappropriate, both advantaged and disadvantaged. Um, a cor that same corporate salesperson who's got a professional sales demeanor for your B2B sales is also used to a larger expense account. So these are things that you as a leader, you're going to have to manage. And um, from my point of view, it's not about, uh, you know, they, they talk about uh, paralysis by analysis, right? And that's the same when it comes to putting that kind of judgment on different monikers. It, it's, um, if, you're, if you're looking at a corporate warrior they could be an extraordinary individual, um, but have done new projects in their corporate environment. So test them out. How comfortable are they with uncertainty? How comfortable are they with um, entrepreneurship as an entrepreneur? Uh, I, I'll, I'll give you an example. So I'm probably a very strange corporate warrior, even though my resume says otherwise, right? So Disney, Gateway, HP, and guided choice. Pretty corporate until you realize, well, at Gateway, I launched uh, and created from scratch a brand new $20 million business uh, unit that later on became a billion dollars. Boom. Uh, at HP, I did the same and tackled the four letter word, which will not be spoken in polite uh, company. Uh, the, but the four letter competitor and we beat them by using very unconventional means. And I drove that with zero budget and zero team. I went out there and I said, I don't actually offered me a team. I said, I don't need a team. I I'm, I'm running to the fire. HP has so many darn people out there, so many hands. I'm just going to go out there and sell, sell my idea internally, sell my plan internally convince marketing to throw a little bit this way, convince product to throw a little bit this way, convince channels to allow for this to happen, convince online to allow for this happen. I had a whole plan, I orchestrated the plan and we stole six points a share, boom. And that was not Jerry, that was literally 
hundreds of people. And as a corporate entrepreneur, I had more resources than any entrepreneur could have out of the gate in his first six months at a company. So the fact that I had all that with zero budget um, tells you that I can jump out there with a PowerPoint and a smile and, and do a raise. So of course we built a product and the whole thing, but you know, it, it goes back to, I think, what is the experience, not the label. And it's really about who is the person, not, not what you see on paper. Uh, and this is why we have interviews. <laughs> I mean, who hires out of, on a site, piece of paper? You, you talk to them, you work with them. And by the way, they may not fit. And, and just to be honest, you know, most of the folks I work with uh, in my past, I've always had, if I didn't know you, I would have a, a you know, one to two month trial period where we get to know each other. Now I'm not the easiest person to work with. So I, I, um, I tell them it's your chance to, to bow out gracefully and, and non awkwardly. Um, if you find out that I'm just not someone you can deal with, because I do get a little maniacal, active, highly caffeinated. And, uh, and you know, I, I'm not everyone's cup of tea. I am a heavy dose of coffee. <laughs> Jerry, so you've done aeronautics, astronomics, and finance. And I'm looking over right at you like, man, how this is nowhere. There's nothing similar to it. I mean, it has to be different skill sets, different mindsets. Talk about how you be successful in all these different areas. On, on paper, you would think, okay, there's no way one person can pull all this <laughs> off. Yeah, you know, I, I think there's, there's one common thing uh, out of everything is um, – I, I, I do truly believe this, and I've told this to my kids, that the greatest skill set you could possibly have that is the most, that is the broadest skill set, no matter what you decide to do, is the, uh, I called it sales skills, but it's, but call it articulation skills, right? The ability to articulate an idea and convince others of that idea. That is the single most important skill I believe any worker could possibly have. Because starting with yourself, you have to be able to convince um, and articulate authentically, this is why truth is so important, but authentically articulate why you deserve that promotion, why you deserve that salary bonus, why you deserve that title that's available out there. That skill set applies no matter what job you have. So as an aerospace engineer, um, yes, I got, you know, I learned physics at Stanford. I learned math in, you know, UCLA. I learned, you know, yes. Okay, sure. So I came in with some chops for sure uh, where I could do that. But I was able to convince and articulate my interest um, and my desire to look at a 1957 memo um, that was laying around and our, and that memo that everybody had forgotten about had this fantastic um, aerospace innovation for rockets. It was a theorized innovation and it was dated 1957 and it was a great theory. Well, when I was at the rocket company, you know, multiple decades after that, I said, we got computers that can do this. In fact, I could code this. So we, uh, I proceeded to work with a number of engineers and I said, you wanna do something like wild? Let's, let's try, and, and nothing like an engineer to say, that, well, and those who said no, I said, oh, okay, I get it. You, you, this, is probably, this is probably too far for you. It's probably not something you, you'd feel comfortable doing because you know, it's a little bit hard for you. Oh, bam. Tell that to an engineer, they're in. They're not only in, they'll shove you out of the way. That's how deep that, and they'll run into it so deep. And so I was able to get like literally 25, 30 engineers creating this. We created an innovation um, that drove 40% in performance improvement in the rocket, 40% improvement. Now, just to give you some sense of that, when you launch a rocket, it's so risk averse. This, the rocket launch industry is so risk averse that 
if you have a 2% performance innovation, it has to go through broad review, including like the Department of Transportation and all of that, because people could get hurt. Well, not only did we drive 40% improvement, we also became a fleet standard and the, uh, across both uh, commercial and military flights. So uh, rocket launches, that's how that is. But I couldn't have done that if I wasn't able to articulate the benefit, articulate the feasibility, articulate and convince engineers who didn't have any extra time to be able to jump on this, uh, convince the senior management, highly risk averse, to take a look at this and try it to convince uh, DC with all their restrictions that this was something that was safe and doable and that we had analyzed this to death. So how is that any different than talking to someone about their financial investments and understanding what their needs are and what their interest is and then designing a program uh, and a, an investment glide path that fits their needs? How is that any different than uh, working with a team of hundreds to say, we are all after the same goal, which is to beat that four letter competitor. And here's how we're gonna do it. Are you in or not? Um, and just for the feature, pure competitive fun of it, uh, we're not gonna get any bonus from this. We're not gonna get anything there, but we'll have the satisfaction. We stole six points a share. That's how you galvanize the team. That's how you get investors in your company. And it's all from a position of authenticity because I didn't, I don't have to remember a lie. If I have an investor ask me something, I could tell them exactly what I told them six, eight, 10 months ago, because it's the truth. And it's exactly what I told them then. It's the same thing I tell them now um, because it's the truth. And so for me, honest articulation in a persuasive manner is the common thread. Um, but I'll be honest, you know, Selling uh, security services to someone is different than, you know, launching a rocket. <laughs> um, you know, talking about uh, a portfolio of investments is very different than, you know, moving a, a box of wires and fans and, you know, and a computer monitor. Um, so it is very different in that context. But uh, it, I just found that as long as you're able to articulate authentically the benefit for the client, the benefit for the colleague, um, the benefit for your leader, the benefit for the investor. Uh, as long as you're focused on what they want, um, th then you truly get what you want. And, and that's just to pull that from Zig Ziglar for anyone that remembers. But, um, you know, it, it's to me, uh, and plus I love learning. Um, so, you know, I taught, I, I learned Python and that was fun. <laughs> Kids these days. Like I had to write those modules and now Python has a whole library of modules that you can just pluck from. And that's pretty funny. Um, so it's actually quite simple to learn. Uh, but anyhow, um, it, it's a, it's a white, I, I like lots of things. And before I, I leave this earth, I, I, I want to make sure I've enjoyed as many adventures as I can. Jerry, can you talk about why and how you believe uh, AI machine learning is going to make the world of finance even better? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it, at its simplest form, AI, artificial intelligence, which is such a interesting misnomer in many ways, and machine learning, um, which, is, which is kind of a subset of that, really is hardcore math. Right, the hardcore data looking for patterns. Where, uh, so what that means is that it can not only potentially predict um, future events if it follows that pattern, or it can actually show uh, existing patterns that you didn't know about today. So I'll give you examples of both, right? Simple pattern. If I know that those who purchase, um, I'll go purchase uh, a suit from uh, Nordstrom's that they're very likely to go buy socks from The Gap, 
whatever it is, right? Okay, that's a level of predictability that is based on probability. Those who purchase, those who are male looking like this at this age and this region will tend to go to the Nordstrom's and then Gap, whatever it may be. Okay, that's good. And that, that, that's very easy for us to understand what's useful about that. That kind of predictability obviously, uh, or probability leads to greater sales of Gap socks or whatever it may be, or a partnership between Gap and Nordstrom, blah, 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 blah. Okay, that's one. Um, the other one though, that is quite important in the world of finance, I think. Um, because there's that, that aspect as well in finance. If you, those who buy term life insurance are also going to be thinking about long-term care so you can sell more products. I, all this is like buying more products from, from like finance, like any, like clothes, there, there's that correlation. But the other aspect of AI and machine learning is uncovering existing patterns. And the press has picked this up in a negative fashion, but I actually think it's quite positive. Um, so when Apple Card came out, right, Goldman Sachs launches the Apple Card for Apple, and you had all these entrepreneurs or VC capitalists, whatever maybe, right, very wealthy folks who, um, where the husband was approved, even though the wife applied. Um, and the pattern it was uncovering was this whole pattern of a tendency to provide higher credit limits to men than to women. I, I'm just reporting the news. I'm not saying it's good or bad or truthful or not. I'm just reporting what happened, right? And it might have been only one or two incidents that happened. I don't know. All I know is that that's always been a suspected correlation in there. And I'm not saying it is a correlation or not a correlation, but I am saying if we embrace what the data tells us, isn't it interesting that it might uncover patterns that were unintentional? And wouldn't that be interesting to be able to intentionally create a new pattern, to intentionally drive towards a new algorithm. And that's where I think there's great and tremendous power in AI and machine learning, which is not the ability for a human being to look at data um, and input algorithms and the machine follows those patterns that are built in that continue and forever entrench everybody into a narrow path that anyone who buys Nordstrom's suits must buy Gap these socks from Gap, right? That's not, that's not the purpose of the algorithm or AI or ML. The, the real power behind it is actually creating the new algorithms and, and, and the reward of that, right? Because if you think about what machine learning is, it's really about, you know, here's a machine, here's an algorithm, we're gonna test little different variations to that. And there's a reward you're trying to optimize. Well, if the reward is profit, Okay, maybe Gap Socks are the most profitable, so that's the partnership that you encourage. I got it. But if the reward was something else, right? If the reward was greater home ownership across the United States um, by everyone, uh, especially lower paid, I don't know. If the reward was something that was better for society, whatever it may be, and I'm just talking right now, but again, there's a judgment factor in there. I get it. People, you know, what's better for society? We have different views, especially these days, where views tend to be very, very differing and very fragmented and sometimes polar opposites of each other. So there is that challenge. But imagine you have the power to actually be able to, I, I'm not saying drive behavior, but offer options and opportunities for better outcomes. And in finance, more than anything else, you can actually offer better outcomes based on informed decisions. And I'll give you a more specific example. If I were able to say, hey, Jason, based on what you've done and what you've told me and you've allowed me to see, here's 
your current financial situation. And here's where, depending on what happens in the world, but here's where it, it would end up being, or here's where we're projecting it to be with 10% of certainty. But if, but Jason, if I showed you a set of decisions you could make that could improve that outcome five, 10, 15 years later, whatever your decision or your time frame or time horizon might be, wouldn't that be positive? Wow, okay, yeah, sure. Show me a different bunch of things and help me make the choice. But what if I don't know? What if I like, you know, I don't know, I have to do some research. Okay, what if it knew you had to do some research and you like to look at Barron's and Wall Street Journal? What if it actually knew that about you? And it says, hey, Jason, here's your current situation. Here's a couple other situations that could occur based on decisions on these factors. And because we know you're a research type of person, we're gonna send you this, the news that's curated to your preference, right? In your control that helps to inform you quickly and allows you to make that decision. And because we know you like to tweak and change things and you're risk averse and something happens, we, you want the ability to change that, we're gonna give you every opportunity. We're gonna, we're gonna ping you every month that says, hey, any changes? Hey, change of attitude? Hey, does the news bother you? You're in control. Now we're talking about really interesting machine learning that is not about, I, I stuff another pair of socks into your order basket, right? But I'm now really attuned to who you are, Jason, and your situation. And I'm allowing you to make more informed decisions. And I'm reacting perhaps even to your mood to be able to enable you to have better control over your finances or the rest of your life. And in that context, that's where I think the real power of AI is, which is not really getting to know your shopping patterns, but really getting to know you, Jason, as a human. And what is it your tendency is? And by the way, if you, Jason, want to change those tendencies, perhaps you, Jason, can make the decision to have this help you stop smoking, stop whatever. I mean, think about it. That's where, that's where AI's power is, right? Where you, the human, are in control and the digital assistant is smart enough to know how to help you, help you be the best you, right? Because of your decision and your definition. That's where I think the power of AI and, and ML and really a lot of this big data math really is. And today it's, it's pushed on us. And I long for the day where it's us driving AI, right? For our own, our own personal uh, benefit and our own personal outcomes. And, and that's different than companies foisting it um, onto you. AI and ML at the end of the day is a tool, I believe, for humans to use for their benefit, not for companies to pull down your throat, right? And, and drive it into your, and reach into your wallet and grab more money. So that, that's, maybe that's a little bit altruistic, but, but by the way, any company that starts to drive that kind of personalization and flexibility to the human, that's a, that's a big money-making company. Um, Cause people, I believe people would pay for the ability to have that kind of digital assistant. Um, cheaper than a, a smoking cessation program, cheaper than, you know, a, a lot of these programs, imagine having that digitally personalized to you. Interesting. Okay. What were your testimony says, you know, I get this, I get the AI piece, but I have privacy concerns. What would you say to those people have privacy concerns? Yeah, I do too. <laughs> but um, look, as Americans, let's face it, um, our phones know how far away we are from our home, that we're a two minute drive from our house, no matter where we are, whatever it is. Uh, 
Google sends me a timeline of where I've been, every city I've been at, um, how long I was there. Uh, Yelp knows what searches I've done in the past. Um, you know, like it or not, there is no privacy in America. I mean, that's for better or for worse. I'm not saying it's good. I'm just saying today there isn't. Uh, and most people either don't know uh, how to change their privacy uh, settings or don't care. And unfortunately, you're looking at a, I, sorry, now, now my value judgment comes out. So I say, unfortunately, you have a, an entire generation, uh, two generations, really, millennials and, and digital natives who are so used to this that it's, sure, I want uh, TikTok to be more personalized and show me videos I want to see, whatever it may be. And, um, and so they're, they're allowing their preferences to be viewed by the companies. And so that's where we're at. I, I think, you know, I tend to be a little bit more private um, and a little more privacy concerned. Um, at the same time, and I, and I say that because of course it, it's not always used for good. Sorry, that's a value judgment. It's never used, it's not necessarily always used the way you individually want it to be used. And, and, and that's the challenge. Right? It'd be great if you had full control over it, but how many startups, I know numerous startups that have gone out there saying, you can control that. You can like block all information. And of course, where are we in this world today? If you block, if you don't allow cookies on your website, you may, you, the website will not be fully functional for you. <laughs> really? You wanna, you wanna live a life that is lesser because you haven't given information. That's kind of the world we're in for better, for worse. So I have high privacy concerns, um, but surprisingly, I, I think in terms of how we all behave, I actually think that's a minority point of view. Um, I actually think most people talk a good talk about privacy, but don't really care. I mean, really they don't. They care about the concept, uh, but they don't really care because they would, they would would they really inconvenience their lives that much by adhering to strictest privacy concerns? Yeah, or, or they they're, they're, they care about their privacy, but no one else's. Correct, correct, yeah. And, and I, I don't know, honestly, I don't know the answer to that. I, I'm not smart enough. I'm not um, imaginative enough of what that is. I, I do know that there's not enough, there's not enough will behind uh, really tackling um, privacy protection. Yeah, and like you said, it, it seems like each generation has a, their own unique definition of what is privacy. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, look at what people post. I mean, for crying out loud. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, so I have concerns about it. Um, I, I'm probably most nervous about. Um, privacy in finance. This is why, you know, for advice analytics for our company, we're, we have the strictest security protocols because I personally believe in being very strict about the security protocols, but in life in general, I, I, I don't know that. I, I actually think uh, if, if you think, if anyone thinks they, there's a privacy issue today, I think we're at a 10th of it tomorrow. I, I actually think five years from now, we're gonna look back and go, oh, the good old days of the 2020s when like information was private. Cause you know, 2025, I think it's gonna be like nothing's gonna be private, I, I think. Yeah, and like I had a friend the other day post on Facebook. The first post was, you know, I'm tired of getting all these, you know, ads on Facebook, you know, I'm tired of, you know, data privacy, blah, blah, blah. Next post, he posted a picture of him getting his like first COVID shot, right? right. Like, uh, like, okay, like, okay now, did you, <laughs> You know, did you see what we just did here? Like, you know, like, but well, of course he, he doesn't, right? Right, right. And, and I think, you know, like you said, everyone has a different definition. Generations have different definitions. Um, you know, and, and if you think about it, yeah, okay, I don't want my, all my information available to the IRS auditor who can look at it and go, you know, the details of my spending and what, what I claimed as a home office expense or blah, 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 blah. blah. Okay, but when I go to Starbucks, they better damn well have my, the right coffee I had right on time, ready with my order, damn it. They should know me. 
so you know so life is what it is and i think it's going to get far more the, the profit incentive and our convenience incentive is way too high and i truly believe the privacy genie is out of the bottle i mean it's way not just out of the bottle it's way in orbit now so <laughs> to go back to my my space vehicle uh, background it, it's way out of reach like i don't think that can ever be put back unfortunately legislation uh apps i, I just don't think i think it's I think it's something we have to learn to live with i agree with you jerry so earlier you talked some about sales and marketing can you talk the importance of like entrepreneurs or people in general like having some kind of minimal level skill set or experience or learning how to do sales and marketing I, I, I think the CEO, I was taught um, by these corporate companies, right? That the CEO has to be by far like the best salesperson. And I don't know if that's always true, but if you think about it back to the, the fundamental skill set I talked about, which I think is the ability to articulate persuasively, I think you have to be that right you have to believe in it authentically believe in it so much and you have to be able to articulate that belief in that enthusiasm so much that you hire the best people that you are able to get aligned investors that you're able to get great partners that you're able to get great clients that you're able to to align with great builders uh, of your product I think as a founder, you have to be that um, as a founder and CEO. And I actually think for most founders, especially technical founders, their inner monologue kind of cracks me up. And I, I know this, I've talked to so many engineer founders and their first thing, like I'll, I'll tell them, we'll talk about the product and invariably I'm there because I'm, I'm helping them with sales uh, or they got, they, they, they uh, tap my shoulder and they say, ah, can you really help me with sales? I'm like, okay, but you know, and the first thing they say to me, like in our meeting, first thing they say is, ah, oh, I'm not a good salesperson. Of course not. You just said you aren't like you, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You declared it and that's exactly correct. So now I want you to say, I am the best salesperson this company could ever possibly have because I gave up my time, my career, my life for this endeavor. Because if you really, really did, then there is no better salesperson than you. I used to tell my sales teams, here's how I want you to do this, right? Sales teams and other teams. I would say, what is a must do? Like, what, what is it like you must do? And they would name a bunch of things. This is, you know, I'd go, no, no, be more specific, right? I must complete this sale or I must complete three sales this week, whatever it is. Okay, all right. So why did you pick the number? Okay, three, I need that for, you know, to, to make it through the week, blah, blah, blah. Okay, got it. So now if I said to you, right, if I said to you, the lives of your loved ones depend on you doing it. Like, I, I mean, not your life, because people tend to want to give up their own life, I guess, but, or they value others' lives perhaps more than their own. The value, like who's the, the one you love the most that you cherish, absolutely important to you, your dog, your wife, your kids, their life depends on you accomplishing what you just said is the most important thing. Oh my gosh. You talk about people getting really uncomfortable, right? And I said, I would say to them, you just told me you must do this. I just told you a different framing for you must do this because the lives of your loved ones depend on this. And yet the framing changes everything. So when you sit there and you go, I must do this, are you just talking to yourself? 
or do the lives of your loved ones depend on it? And I would say that the greatest strength any founder can have is to be able to say, sit there and go, I must do this because the lives of my loved ones depend on this. When I entered into this world, again, after two decades, it wasn't, a, it wasn't from the perspective of a mid 20 year old, which said, hey, this would be really cool. I made some money off of it, right? Which I didn't have to do. I'd, get a, I'd go get a job. I walked into this and I said, the lives of my kids and family depend on this because they do. Because if I don't do this and I don't succeed at this, they go hungry. I've not served my role as father, as husband, as protector of the house. I could lose the house and everything I've worked for. So I must do this. And I'll tell you, it, it just gains all sorts of focus and, and grit and resilience and tenacity when you sit there and you go, I must do this because the lives of my loved ones depend on this, whatever this is. And so I, I'd say, you know, honestly, when you're an engineer and you're like, I don't, I don't know how to sell. I don't know how to sell is a fact. I can't sell is a failing. So I would say to any founder out there, if you've got a skill set, whatever it is, the one skill set you need to have is the I must do this. It's tenacity. It's, it's the lives of my loved ones depend on this. And then find a way to do it, whatever the it is. That to me is the only skill set you really need to have. Everything else comes from your experience, from your desire, from your interest, from learning, from webinars, from whatever it is. But the, that tenacity, that sensibility of saying the lives of my loved ones depend on this because they really do because it's everything that they depend on me for. So I must do it. I must find a way I must do it or I must do something else. I don't think there's any other skill set you could possibly have. Hey, Jerry, that's to me, that's pretty empowering right there. Thanks for that. Absolutely. So Jerry, before you talk about um, uh, selling your dream. So how does a founder do this? How does a founder sell a dream when, you know, maybe the co-founder quit Maybe they get rid of the tech team because they meet expectations. Or maybe, you know, 10 potential sales fell through. Or maybe their spouse has said, hey, you know, you've been doing this quite a bit time, quite a long time, right? And that's coming in. Maybe you need to start looking for a job. How does the founder still sell their dream with all this negativity going on, so to, so to speak? Yeah. Oh, man. Listen, I, I, <laughs> I've heard, I've, uh, that three of those four have happened, right? And so for me, so I, I, I've lived it and I've lived a lot more, believe me. I've had family tell me, you sure about this? Um, I've had uh, investors tell me, you know, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. I, I literally have heard that. Uh, I've had, um, <laughs> I've had what's maybe worse than that because at least they were honest and that was great. Uh, I, I, the investor that said that to me. The other side of it is of course, that's a, that's a fantastic, awesome idea. Um, you know, I just, I just think you're not right for us uh, yet. Come back to me in a year. And, and it's like, okay, was that fantastic? You'd be talking to me now, but okay. Um, but yeah, I, I've, and I've heard, you know, my spouse, my wife has said, you know, um, you know, faucet broke. Are you going to fix it? Cause I'm not, and I can't get a plumber. I mean, yeah, you know, I'm like, okay, well, yeah, we're not that hard up, but then again, I need as long of a runway as possible. And this is the thing, right? I could pay for a plumber to go fix that, but I need as long of a runway as possible. And I have to make decisions, as I'm sure many founders out there do, 
Do I fix it myself and save cash for a longer runway, but lose time on the startup? I mean, these are like the dumb, but really painful decisions you got to make. It's, it's a whole lot of negativity out there, man. I mean, it really is. And it's funny, we talked about my uh, positivity, I guess, which I don't look at as positivity. I just look at it who, it's who I am. Um, but, you know, I look at that and I go, well, I may not have resources. I didn't have resources at HP. I may not have a budget or a team or whatever it may be, but I've got, I've got the will. I've got loved ones I'm looking to protect. I've got resourcefulness. And someone taught me, uh, a mentor taught me that you may have limited resources. The world has limited resources, but as a human being, you have unlimited resourcefulness. And that resourcefulness is what you got to get back to. You have to be an impossibly good problem solver. And while, and I say that carefully, I say impossibly good because it, it's, it's impossible to be a good problem solver at every problem. It's impossible. But you have to do the impossible. And that's what we as founders have the tenacity to do. I, I would say, you know, look, my wife has said, you know, maybe it's time to go back to that high, high paying job you used to have. Um, I'm missing kind of that vacations, you know, the annual vacations that I used to have, the five star resorts we used to go to. And by the way, that's the other additional benefit of being a corporate warrior. You get paid really well. <laughs> And I was paid really well. I went from paid really well to paid, you know, not nothing um, and not much. So, you know, how did I respond to that? I, I, I told her, and this is how I operate. And we each have to know how we each operate ourselves, right? How do you put your, how do you paint yourself into a corner that you have to get out? How do you put yourself into an escape room that you have to get out, right? You have, each of us has to know how to do that. So I did it the only way I knew how to do it, which was I gave her a date. I said, by October 1st, if I don't get X number of dollars, I'm going to go get a job. And I, by the way, I've never, this is just a thing for me, I've never broken a promise to my kids, which is why it's very rare I make a promise, right, at all. <laughs> That the kids will corner me. Do you promise? Do you promise? I'll say no. I don't promise because I can't. I don't. I can't control the environment. So they know when I promise something, I absolutely will deliver it. That's those are my musts. I I told my wife literally last year. I said uh, I gave her a date and I said I promise that if we don't get to a certain threshold by that date, I will start the other path. That was good enough. And lo and behold, the day before that date, the two days before that date, I hit the time, I hit the threshold. And that proved to me two things. One, whew, I could really get there, right? Man, I mean, there's nothing like hitting a threshold, right? And two, that if I didn't hit the threshold, whatever happened, it was going to be a good thing. Because like it or not, as a founder, when you're that tenacious and that, that relentless, you, you don't know when to stop. And, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, it, it, it's, it became clear to me at certain points, I have to know when to stop. I have to know when the dream is not going to happen, or I have to choose a different dream. Um, I've been fortunate that and I've laid down three deadlines for that dream to happen, right? It was a must, like the, the lives of my loved ones depend on me. And so does my dream. The dream of my future depends on me and I have to hit it by this date. I set three dates. And the first one I came within literally 48 hours, I hit the threshold and I was able, I was allowed to get to the second date. 
the second date I, I hit ahead of schedule and this third date, which is later on this year, we're, we're already progressing towards that. I, I feel, and the more, the earlier I'm hitting these things before my dates, the more confidence I have, the, and I've shared this with the team, the more confidence the team has, the more excited we get, and it builds a habit of hitting those thresholds. But I can tell you right now, if I didn't hit those thresholds, I would be able to look back with pride and with satisfaction that I gave it my all, man, because the lives of my loved ones depended on it. And I didn't hit that threshold on that date. And I'm, I will change to a different path because my loved ones matter more to me than anything else. And so that, that's how I view it, which is, you know, I convinced myself of that line in the sand. And if you cross the line in the sand without what you promised to achieve, then you have to, then, then the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and, and getting, expecting a different result. And you're not going to get a different result. Move on. So I, I'm, I like that kind of brutality because it, it just forces a decision. And I just, I've found so many, I've spoken with so many entrepreneurs where, you know, they've been at it for six years. It's like that. If it ain't flying, in six years, it ain't going to fly. It's just not going to fly. Um, you know, and they've been pursuing the same thing for six years. Wrong. Pursue the same thing for six months. And, and if you can't get some kind of traction, adjust it, change it, tweak it. You don't have to give up on it, but just shift it and get used to a pivot because the world is telling you something and, and you're saying something different. And if you can't convince them of something different, then you got to find something else that you can convince them of. It's not that your idea is bad or that it, it won't happen. You may not be the person to make that happen. That's the hard truth. And, and those are the types of hard truths that like John Seacrest or anyone else would pound into your head. That, that's the type of thing that um, as a corporate leader, I would, I would ensure people were honest with themselves. But you as a founder, me as a founder, I had to be the most honest with myself. And, and that's brutal, man, it's brutal. But, but you know, we are made of tough constitution. So we founders, we, we're, this, this is not for the faint of heart. This is for the, the you know, as Steve Jobs or in, in the famous Apple ad said, these are the dreamers and the, the doers and the workers. And, Believers and the fanatics and the crazed maniacs. These, we're we're an unnatural lot, um, but it, it, that means we can handle the truth. So let's be let's be honest with ourselves about that and pivot if you need to pivot. Jerry, can you talk to more details about your company, Advice Analytics, like specifically how it came about and your vision for the company? Absolutely, yeah. So, four hundred one k compliance. Doesn't sound like the sexiest, most exciting thing out there, right? I, I get it. I get it. You know, 401k retirement plan compliance. There are $10 trillion of assets in, in 401k retirement plans. $10 trillion. Uh, I think I mentioned this before. It's larger than the combined GDP of Western Europe countries. It is massive and huge. The entire industry is $35 trillion, which essentially is bigger than the GDP of the world. It's freaking amazing. But it's all governed by the Department of Labor and the IRS. There's a set of regulations, ERISA regulations, that govern 401k. Not all retirement plans, but 401k in particular. And these regulations uh, drive compliance. And so most providers and everybody's forgotten what those regulations are for. How did they come about in 1974? They came about because in one famous case is with Studebaker where the executives would make decisions to take away your retirement. Hard to believe, but think about that. The executives of a company could say, you're eligible for your retirement money after 10 years and then fire you 
at 9.9 years. Nine years and 360 days, they fire you so you don't get your retirement, but then they hire you back and you start all over. That's the sort of crap that could happen. That's why the regulations came about because there was excessive, not everyone, but there was excessive decisions that were taking away your retirement, your hard earned, you deserve everyday worker retirement money. Regulations that state the everyday American worker actually has to receive the 401k benefit before highly compensated employees. Yeah, your everyday worker is supposed to get the 401k benefit before any executive. And that's the challenge today. We have 70% of plans failing their compliance audit, not because companies are malicious necessarily, but because if you have more money, the executives and the highly compensated, you tend to put more money in. And the whole who runs the program, everyone's focused on making sure that people are putting money in, but they're not necessarily absolutely focused on incentivizing the lower paid everyday worker to put money in, because that's how you stay in compliance. Now, wait a second. If advice analytics can help the employer get their retirement plan in compliance, it means by default, fundamentally, we're helping everyday American workers invest more and get better retirement outcomes. Well, wait a second now. There are 100 million everyday American workers busting their butt, saving for retirement outcomes in their 401k. 100 million. And by getting all the employers into compliance, we could help all those American workers generate $300 billion in additional savings every freaking year that goes to their retirement outcome. So that's, that's the beauty of this. I spent uh, time as um, within a firm that was a 338 fiduciary investment advisor. We were digital. We worked with 401k plans. I spent a lot of time in the industry talking to ERISA lawyers, to attorneys, to plan sponsors, to HR benefits managers, to record keepers, to asset managers, to advisors. I was in a very unique situation where I could speak to a lot of different folks about this industry, an industry that was based on mainframe computers back in the 1970s when this was passed, <laughs> technology that's based on databases that are very old. In some cases, they're still on tape. Are you kidding me? How many record keepers, how many plans are actually on the cloud? It's freaking unbelievable only because of the pandemic the pandemic that the department of labor allowed for e disclosure for electronic disclosures versus paper are you kidding me there's so much that is sucking money out of this industry when this is a problem that technology can solve this is a problem that robotic process automation can solve this is a this is a world where there's so much money and the technology is so outdated that we have an opportunity to jump in with 2010 technology and do something dramatic so, so not even 2021 but 2010 Forget about 2021. <laughs> now, the fact that i sat down and you know last year wrote out the algorithms for predictive compliance wrote down and designed the platform I'm looking at for that drives towards um, more participation by everyday American workers that allows for an audit ready IRS audit ready document vault that also enables HR managers to better manage their plans to better uh, have transparency about their compliance to have reminders to file that form 5500 that's coming up soon all of that was something I crafted a year, year and a half ago. I've been thinking about since uh, 2018, um, but really manifested itself 
during the pandemic. And because of the pandemic, we have had, and the change in administration, we are looking at more legislation, more regulatory legislation in, in about 14 months than we've had in the past 14 years. I mean, it's talk about compressed and a whole lot of stuff that's geared towards what? Helping part-time workers, SECURE Act, helping part-time workers be able to contribute into their retirement plans, right? CARES withdrawals, being able to put money back in that they took out from their 401k and so on and so forth. There's so many opportunities out there. And the vast majority of these opportunities are geared towards American workers, not employers. American workers and more secure retirement futures. And that's the mission for advice analytics, to really help employers get the 401k compliance, which is an equal state to helping everyday American workers have more secure retirement futures. Employers can be happy because they're paying fewer penalties and they're spending less time on compliance. Their CFO is happy because it costs less. The employees are happy because they have better retirement outcomes or access to better retirement outcomes. The IRS is happy because fewer uh, companies are out of compliance. Um, and of course, Advice Analytics is happy and our investors are happy because we're generating um, lots of revenues that are still less than the penalties uh, and corrective distributions and the uh, compliance spend that employers spend. So everybody wins. We, we suck our money out of the industry. That's a lot less than what is being sucked out today. And all that excess can go back in the industry, back into people's pockets. And that's what we're perhaps most proud of and most excited about. Um, and certainly our uh, clients, our HR managers and, and the um, partners that we have are extremely excited about as well. Jerry, so how did you deal with all the bureaucracy without just being totally frustrated all the time, just throwing your hands in the air and like, I can't do this. Like, how did you work, work through that bureaucracy <laughs> you had to deal with? Yeah, you know, um, dealing with corporate bureaucracy, <laughs> having that experience and dealing with corporate bureaucracy means that I, I'm, I, this stuff is, is cake. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, you know, that aside, I think every one of us has to be driven by whatever our internal mission is. And for me, um, the opportunity to help uh, and, and protect the retirement plans of 100 million Americans, that's a, that's a pretty powerful opportunity. And, and it's, as I've said before, you know, you're on this earth for a short amount of time. And if we can do stuff, do good, um, and do well, that, that's a pretty powerful combination. And, and, I, and I have to say that's what motivates me past some of the intense grind that we have to go through sometimes as founders uh, or as workers or as janitors, uh, all the hats we have to wear uh, as a founder or CEO. And for me, it's, um, I, I'm happy to wear all those hats and do all the things we have to do. Uh, if that's what gets us to the uh, end state and the vision. And again, you know, truly doing wonderful things for my loved ones um, and, and providing uh, ultimately for them and, and having them proud of me that, you know, I'm, I'm here to support a hundred million Americans. I and mean, that's the sort of thing, you know, I want my kids to, you know, if, my, if they're asked, what does your dad do? It'd be pretty cool for them to say, yeah, he helps, you know, he, he has a company that helps hundred million, a hundred million American workers um, have a more secure retirement future. That's a, that's a pretty damn good line. And, uh, and so those are the types of things that drive me. Um, and, and that's not to say or trivialize the bureaucracy, the grind, the, the, the slowness of things, you know, we are talking about, the government we are talking about compliance it's there's just the <laughs> there's a there's a nature to this beast that is 
um, that can that can be difficult. But by the way, all that bureaucracy, all those rules, the arcane regulations, that's a fantastic moat against my competitors, by the way. Um, and the intricacies of the ecosystem and the relationships that are in the ecosystem. There's a lot of firms that have no ability to tackle and have what I have. So that's another good thing. Every time I'm slowed by the molasses in the industry uh, or by the bureaucracy or the grind, I just remind myself, I am far better suited to handle this grind than any of these other competitors might be. So that's a good thing. So I, I, I like, doing the difficult thing because um, those are weaker willed or lesser experienced will fall to the wayside. And if you can't tell, I, I'm about, I'm a competitive bastard. <laughs> so I, I like to win. Um, so yeah, yeah, there's some of that. And that's what, you know, that and coffee will get me through any grind. <laughs> Jerry, so this is probably a two part question. Who is your perfect customer and who actually pays for your product? Ah, yeah, great question. So it, it ends up being the same, uh, well, kind of the same group. So, so uh, ideal customer, you're talking about the HR benefits manager, overworked, under-resourced. They're the ones that actually have to fill out the form 5,500. Yes, there's tools to do that. They have advisors, they have consultants, they have record keepers. But at the end of the day, the employer sponsor of the 401k has ultimate fiduciary liability. They are the last buck that stops with them in terms of full liability of the retirement plan. Even hiring others to do tasks, it, they hold the liability of, hire, of hiring the wrong fiduciary, uh, of not doing the sufficient due diligence on that fiduciary. So when your hired vendor makes a mistake, that's on you. Very few, if any industry blames that employer 100% for a failure of their vendor. Uh, and that's what 401k regulation is all about. There is no hiding. There's no place to hide. You, the plan sponsor, you, the employer are the last buck you have full accountability for that retirement plan. And in that business, it's often the CFO or the HR person that is the named fiduciary for that 401k plan. And both of them will assign this to the HR benefits manager as if they have nothing better to do, but to also track day to day 401k compliance amidst all their other activities of healthcare compliance, ACA compliance, FSA, HSA, enroll, uh, uh, benefits enrollment, their H&W plans, all those things. Uh, oftentimes they have, they're under-resourced and overworked and they are um, charged with managing the 401k plan, the paperwork, uh, all the documents, the plan committee meeting minutes, uh, the ERISA fidelity bond, making sure that um, compensation matches what's already in the plan document, timely deferrals, the operations and administration of the 401k plan. And that's a lot. And so that overworked HR manager who's focused on a lot of different things, recruiting and compensation. Yeah, we used to add that, like people don't realize how expensive HR is, right? Like HR is recruiting, talent, culture, benefits, drug compliance, safety, you know, and basically whatever the CEO doesn't want to do, HR does it usually, right? And it's, exactly. it's a lot. Underworked, uh, sorry, overworked, under-resourced. Um, and of course, if there's any mistake in the compliance, if the IRS comes in an audit and there's a tiny little failure, but the penalties are X thousands, hundreds of thousands, that's a black mark on that HR manager. Uh, but when they do a fantastic job and everything passes, they get no recognition. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the job. That's just the job. Well, that's why we built uh, our product. So we are 
major product is our primary product that we have is called RoboVault. RoboVault is there uh, with two aspects. One, a vault for a secure repository of your files and documents. But the robo aspect is an automated assistant based on the documents that you have or don't have that reminds you of what documents to input. It reminds you of the workflow that needs to occur and the deadlines to which they occur. So consider it as a digital compliance assistant that's really there to help you manage the 401k. That's our first incarnation. We'll be expanding that out, of course, to broader benefits. But right now, the focus is on really helping them with that um, plan, 401k plan management and compliance uh, within that frame. And the idea is to keep it as simple and straightforward for that HR manager as much as possible. And typically what happens is that it comes from, the, the, we priced it so that it can come from the HR budget. Um, if you're a larger uh, mid-enterprise or an enterprise, that's where you do probably have to bring in the CFO or the financial analyst um, to make sure it fits within the budget or, or better yet, can it be in someone else's budget? Um, but that, that's really where, in terms of who pays for it, uh, that's where it comes from. But it is the employer that will ultimately pay for it with or without our product. You're gonna pay for the compliance penalty. You're gonna pay for the compliance effort. You're gonna pay for all the claims that might occur um, and, and paying for our product the idea was to price it such that it was a small fraction of what you would pay for and it, in terms of the penalty. Um, and it would be uh, an assistant for HR, the operator, to really uh, more easily manage their 401k to compliance. And so that HR person can do something else, right? Grow in their career, work on the culture of the division, um, broad, look at it strategically in terms of other uh, insights and data. And ultimately, of course, and this is what we talk about, keeping the plan in compliance means making sure that the rank and file of employees of your company are in fact benefiting uh, as much uh, as the executives are for your 401k plan. Thanks, Jerry. Mm -hmm. So me and Jerry, we're doing this talk on March 19th. A couple of days ago, there was like a horrific tragic event in Atlanta where this guy killed eight people, six of them being Asian American females. I know me and you, Jerry, both want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I, I think it's appropriate um, because as I mentioned before, you know, I, not necessarily intentionally, but certainly um, directionally, I've built a company that is 50-50 men and women that is uh, diverse in ethnicity, diverse in background. And I truly believe that's the core and the secret and the, maybe it's not, hopefully it's not a secret, but it, the core ingredient to our success and to our ongoing success. And violence against anyone is just, is negative. I mean, it's, there's a negativity to that, of course. And this tragic event, unfortunately, um, had a, it seemed and appeared to have a pattern to it. And I don't know if it's really a pattern or not a pattern, but you and I talked about this. It was, that occurring was terrible, was just horrible. And, and you get angry about it, and, and, or I get angry about it, and I get upset about it violence against women, violence against Asian women, but it's the reaction, <laughs> um, I think that, that really tore me up, right? And, and as positive as I am about humanity, this is exactly the worst of humanity. When a leader, a so-called leader, not a leader, clearly, but so-called, a, a person of authority, a person that has a statement that can be heard, put it off as a bad day. I've had bad days and I've never once tried to hurt people on that bad day. 
Uh, and if anything, I might have hurt somebody with my words because I was a bit harsh. But but physical violence that leads to death, that ain't a bad day. I, that's that's. I'd rather that person come back out and say, hey, sorry for that. I had a bad day because <laughs> he that spokesperson had a bad day um, in terms of saying that, perhaps. But the shooter, this was not a bad day. This is not a, this is not an isolated incident. We're seeing Asian American or Asian violence, uh, anti-Asian violence up uh, tremendously during this pandemic. Um, and it's not a secret that it was fueled um, by other leaders, non-leaders in their comments. Um, so yeah, it's upsetting. But I go back to who I am fundamentally. And I could sit here and rage and, and be upset, or I can take action the way I think action can be taken for me. And I'm not saying anybody else has to do it this way, but I know I'm taking action. And, and part of that is talking about this because, and that's why I, I wanted us to talk about this because it's not something to hide from or to, or to avoid. It's certainly something we can debate and I'm open to debating, but eight lives are gone, man. That didn't have to, really didn't have to, whether it was a bad day or not. And I re, and to me, it, it's not about what your opinion is or what your thought is. That's just a fact. And, and I would encourage the listeners, I would encourage each of us, do action that, that's you, do action that feels authentic to you. And if it's, you don't care, you don't care. Okay, I, I get it. But if it happens close to your home, in your world, are you gonna want others to care or not care? I don't know. I mean, only each of us as individuals can answer that. And I'm not judging anyone for whatever your answer might be, but I think it's worth talking about it's worth continuing to talk about whether it's violence against black asian latin x white women transgender lgbtq whatever it may be i mean is this is that is that the right answer i i don't think so so what are we going to do about it i think we all can have our opinions on it, but what are you gonna do about it? And I think that's an honest question each of us has to answer for ourselves. For me, I got my set of actions and um, I can tell you without going into detail that every one of it is positive because that's who I am and that's what I'm good at. Um, you know, shouting and yelling and throwing stuff at people, that ain't me, uh, but, but I am gonna, be positive about it because that is me, and you know that that's how I'm going to do it. So, um, but anyhow, that that's I think that was worth having a conversation. About. Yeah, Jared, like you said before, for that person to say he you knows a bad day, like, are you kidding me? And then I know at least one paper or one news organization said, you know, blank blank a God fearing America, like what? Like, uh, so you saying a God fearing man, man just randomly kills eight people? I just I just couldn't comprehend those two things right there is like, I don't know. He, he must be fearing the wrong God. <laughs> Cause that, a good and just God that, that he don't accept him. And then like, I you know, depending on point of view, you might think it's a positive or negative, but I believe it was yesterday or two days ago where this 75 year old Asian American woman got attacked in San Francisco. Yeah. And she basically beat the crap that dude with her stick. Right. I'm like, <laughs> put him in the hospital. Right. They showed him on like on the little uh, ambulance bed or whatever, just, Skull basically cracked in by this, this lady, right? Yeah, I, on one hand, you know, you go grandma. I mean, you know, uh, on the other hand, I, I, I worry about violence on violence. Look, I'm not a, I'm not a peace beat Nick or anything like that. You know, I, I just to be very clear, I, I, uh, 
I have encouraged and helped um, the women in my family be able to defend themselves, right? And I myself have, you know, I, I've been trained in martial arts and, and other things. And my dad was army, so go army. Um, but my view on, on violence in general is, look, you, you gotta, you know, maybe it's a little bit of Teddy Roosevelt, right? You know, um, you know walk, walk softly, but carry a big stick. I mean, you know, you gotta be able to defend yourself. I encourage everybody, you know, defend yourself physically. And that defense might be run, run faster than the bear chasing you. That's okay too. I get it. Right. Um, you know, cause I, I, all my kids can run fast. So I, I said, you know, let me teach you how to run first. Right. And, and that's okay. You can, you can choose to run or not run. Um, but there, there come, there, there will come times where you have to be able to protect yourself and, and the ones you love. And I think that's not saying, I'm not, that's not for or against any particular method, but it is to say that um, I, I'm in favor of uh, defending yourself as appropriate, uh, fully in favor of that. So, so you go, Grandma. Gary, is there anything that I sort of asked you that I have not? Um, you know, I, I think the, I'll offer a thought about kind of like a, like a work-life balance sort of thing, um, which you alluded to before with regards to all the crazy things that have to be done as a, as a startup founder. Um, and, and the one thing we all forget, we all forget to balance, and you kind of alluded to it. You, you didn't forget, you remembered, but the illusion, of, and I didn't really speak to it, which is really the balance of, you know, work, um, that you have to do in terms of all the things by itself, it's a, it's a, like a three full-time employee job you know, for one person to start a company that, that right there is triple anything I've ever done as a full-time employee. Then there's the loved ones that you're doing it for, or I'm doing it for others might be doing it for other reasons, but I'm doing this for the loved ones. And for my loved ones, you got to spend time with them. You got to listen. You got to, I mean, there's, there's, I don't want to call it work. There's quality time and quality uh, yourself that you want to put into that. And that's important. But the one thing we don't, we always forget, and, and I forget this all the time. Maybe others don't, but I forget this, which is, you know, the third leg of that stool, which is me, like the self-care, the, you know, the taking care of your own thought process. And, and, and that's actually, extremely important. And in reality, I think it's actually maybe perhaps the most important because if you can't give your best self to your company and your best self to your loved ones, then, then you're doing both or either a disservice. And how you define your best self is up to the individual. But for me, um, you know, it's really about making sure I've got this you know, happiness energy going on because I'm a happy guy. And however anyone defines it, um, I, I would really say, you know, check your internal dashboard. <laughs> you know, you, you might build a dashboard that's wonderfully intuitive for your clients. Um, your car has a fantastic dashboard to show you how fast you're going or how, how much gas you have. Um, but you gotta, you gotta be able to monitor your own internal dashboard and that internal dashboard of, of being self-aware of what you're feeling, what you're lacking, are you hungry, uh, go get a bite to eat, are you thirsty, go get some coffee, are you, you know, are you missing hum humanity, go, you know, don't just watch Netflix, I mean, you, you gotta, I mean, I don't know, there, there's, to me, there's a, a, there's a human aspect to yourself that you kind of have to almost look outside of yourself back at yourself and it was very very existential very very metaphysical but you know look in a mirror wh whatever it is that really says engages honestly how you how are you jerry right how am i how am i how the heck am i um and really answering that question 
in multiple facets. In other words, when you ask yourself, how you doing, Jerry? Don't answer automatically, I'm fine, right? I mean, I, I do that, <laughs> but I can't do that. I have to say, well, physically, I feel good. Uh, intellectually, I'm spent. Um, emotionally, I'm engaged. Socially, I'm, I'm missing people. Wh whatever it is, like articulate it. And then take a little bit of time to act on it. And, and I just find that as a reminder for everyone out there, you know, that there's a, the world deserves the best you you can deliver. The world wants the best you you can deliver. You want the best you you can deliver. So don't forget that in, in balancing, you know, work life, it's really call it work, work, life, self balance. Um, and and I, I encourage everyone to do that. And, and I don't mean to be navel gazing, but there's a, there's a, there is a joy and reward to that kind of and strength and bravery and courage to really, um, really think about your own self status. Jerry, I understand you have something for our listeners today. Absolutely. Look, it, I would not be uh, a salesperson of any repute if I did not offer a great deal. So, <laughs> so look, it, it, if you are that overworked and under-resourced HR manager, and I don't know of a single HR manager that isn't overworked and under-resourced, and you've got all that responsibility for 401k benefits management and no appreciation, listen, we appreciate you. And uh, as an example of that, if your business has a 401k, whether you are in audit, have been in audit, uh, fear the IRS audit, um, whatever it may be, if you're looking at how you manage that plan and you need some help, even if you don't need some help, take a look at it. Get on the wait list for a free trial. Look, there's no risk. Free trial to keep your plan in compliant uh, in compliance, you don't want to risk the hundreds of thousands of dollars or worse, millions of dollars that it could cost your company to be out of compliance. Save that money, gain peace of mind, help your employees. Uh, even when that IRS auditor comes knocking on your door, virtual door, your Zoom, whatever it may be, um, have the peace of mind and confidence. Just email me. Email me at jyen.com at adviceanalytics.com. And we'll put you on the wait list for a free trial to stay compliant. There's no obligation to buy. You check it out, you hate it, no problems. We'll, we'll, sit, we'll give you a big high five and, and welcome you back uh, if you ever come back. But we think you'll love it. And so uh, just try it. Um, again, that's J-Y-E-N at Advice Analytics. Dot com. That's with the C um, for compliance. And for HR managers out there, we're on your side. Uh, come check us out and sign up for that free trial. And we'll walk you through it. And uh, we'll see if we can't help get you into compliance um, with very little work and help you stay in compliance as a digital compliance assistant. Jerry, can you share your social media for both yourself and your company so people can reach out to you? Sure, absolutely. So we're on LinkedIn, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, just search for Advice Analytics, uh, Advice Analytics on any of those uh, items. We're not yet on TikTok, um, but that's what we're talking about. But LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, just look for Advice Analytics. Again, that's with the C. A D V I C E, so advice C for compliance. And uh, again, or you can just email me uh, if you want to go uh, email. Email always works at J Y E N, J Y E N, at adviceanalytics.com. Free trial. And to our listeners, we have the links to his gifts and his social media on the show notes. You find the show notes at www.cabinetshlblog.com. And be sure to share this episode with your friends and don't forget to donate to our crowdfunding campaign at https.cavinshr.co slash crowdfunding. 
Jerry, so we're coming to the end of this great talk. Can you give us any last minute wisdom or advice or any subject you want to talk about? Yeah, I, look, life is easier when you're authentic. Life is easier when you're real with yourself and with others. And while there's situations that you might want to be neutral, you're only on this earth for a short amount of time. Be true to you, be true to uh, do good by others. Um, and, uh, and listen, keep on listening, be great. Uh, well, uh, Jason tells you to be great. I, I encourage you to be great. Be the you, the best you, the greatest you that you can be every day. It's hard. It's not always easy. Get through it. Fight through it. Um, but the reward is your own happiness meter, your own value meter. Um, and when you do good by others, it, it just is just positive. Imagine if we all, all the listeners, um, went out there and did some good out there. That's and keep doing it. That that's pretty amazing. So I would just say, you know, be be uh, be true to yourself. It's it's uh, a, it, it, the rewards are, are definitely yours. Jerry, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. You got it, Jason. Thank you. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.